Hey guys, welcome back to the show. Today we are going to first be thankful for the point of the season that we're in right now. You know, as a Canadian especially with the long winters, this is my Christmas. This is the best time of the year. We're in tomato season. Tomatoes are all over the place. We've been eating tomato sandwiches, tomato soup, salsa. We've been doing tons of stuff with tomatoes, uh, zucchinis. It's been a great last couple weeks. So be thankful for the moment that you're in and cherish that moment that you're in. Okay, so what's today's video about? I hinted at it in my last video. Today we're going to talk about the difference between things I teach, say not to do, the difference between doing them systematically and maybe doing them as a one-time thing where it maybe makes sense. So let's talk about things that I tell you not to do and let's put that big asterisk there and maybe it might be a good idea to do it. You decide, I'll tell you why and when you should maybe consider doing some of those alternative practices that I say never, never do. Stick around. Okay, so we are in the extreme experiment wild lower garden right now. And I want you to focus on, while I'm filming this and talking, I want you to focus on not the wild crazy mess that this might look at, but the insect life. Maybe as I walk around and disturb things, you might see different insects popping up um, from the plants that were, you know, hiding there. Um, there's such a tremendous amount of insect life going on right now in this lower wild crazy garden. Now back to what we're talking about is one time disturbances of these areas. This is actually a lower garden that used to look like this back area over here. And it was just a wild uncut field And it used to look like this. I came in here and mowed, and then I actually removed the sod. This was before I knew about sheet mulching. I removed the sod and I did a double deep till, a one-time starting till. Okay, so what that means is when I dug this crescent garden out, I actually dug down a shovel depth, put all the soil here, and then I dug down another shovel depth Put all the soil here and then back filled it back in so this was kind of like and broke it up as i did so this was like a super deep one-time till and the reason why i did that is first off because i'd read somewhere that tilling your garden is good and doing a double deep till is how you want to start a garden bed up maybe wouldn't do it this way again because this area isn't deeply compacted but the reason why it's bad is because it destroys the soil life and if you picture yourself as, you know, a worm or a beetle or something like that, like picture a worm and some giant comes along, like a giant space alien comes along and literally picks a shovel full, like your city, your whole city worth of dirt and just rips it up in the air and smashes it down and then puts you back in and you're lying along the rubble of apartment buildings and stuff. That's what life is like for the soil life when you come in and do a double deep till or you do any tilling at all you kill most of the soil life and not only that but they set up networks and homes and all this sort of stuff like the mushrooms set up these fantastic mycelial networks that you just absolutely destroy some of those things take a year to grow again to reestablish. so if you till systematically very very bad because every year you come along it takes a year to build that mycelial net and then you destroy it every year, you never get a good mycelial net growing. That means poor nutritional transfer, poor water transfer, uh, poor communication between plants for insects, so many things. Mushrooms are really the MVP of the world, really. So you're destroying the MVP of the world, who's an MVP of your garden, systematically every year. Now, if you're starting from just grass and you have severe compaction, say 
um, farm vehicles were driven back and forth across an area and it's completely compacted, then maybe a double deep till is okay for once getting started. Break that compaction up and then never till again. And just on that, we as people tend to always think that we have it really bad when we usually have it a lot better than we think. A lot of people who think they have compacted soils, natural no-till soils will get very dense. So dense that you can actually step on them and not really damage plant roots or anything. Like that dense, like a walking path density. Now, depending on if you have thick wood chips and all that, like what other things you have planted, you might be able to pull the wood chips back and put your, your arm in pretty deep. You might have a fluffy loam, but you might also have, you know, fairly compacted soil. It's just actually not really comp like compacted. It's the mycelial net that's holding it all together, making it feel compacted. So just because, like if I had a, if I cut down a forest and there was an old growth forest and then I want let's just say, and then I wanted to put a garden there and I felt that the soil was kind of compacted, I'd be wrong because that soil is old growth forest soil. It's not compacted. It's actually probably really healthy soil. So just be wary of what you call compacted and how much you know, you're complaining about your situation and think you have to fix it because you may not have to fix it and you fixing it might actually be worse. But if you have severe compaction, go ahead and do a deep double till. You know, no, super no-till guy here telling you Maybe till. Okay, let's talk about weeding now. As we watch the wonderful insect life flying around these Queen Anne's lace, and we watch a bee, oh, just took off, pollinating clovers. I like to say, don't systematically mine nutrients from your soil by weeding and removing that material. Let's talk about what that means specifically. Okay, again, we're talking about systematically doing this. If there's a noxious weed that you're dealing with and you want to get rid of it, the whole don't disturb the soil um, and don't systematically mine your nutrients, if you have a plant that you think you can get most of the rhizome, you may not get out there again very frequently, you want to get most of that plant out of there, feel free to go ahead and pull it out. Like, don't, don't not weed ever because I told you not to systematically mine your nutrients. That's not really what I was talking about and a very once in a while thing is okay to do, especially as a startup. If you just did a double deep till and severed rhizomes of weeds and you have a bunch of weeds popping up now because you just broke maybe one matted weed into millions of little weeds that like little root fragments that now nucleate their own little root crown and send a, a weed up and you just may turn one weed into like a million then feel free to kind of as a startup remove those weeds from your system from the, the get-go you can compost them get it nice and hot get them before they go to seed and then you can return that nutrient but that's more of what the whole don't weed thing is about it's, it's about two things. Okay, here's my pear tree, and if I were to systematically remove all these, you know, air quote weeds, that's a lot of biomass that's right here. It's a lot of photosynthesis that's happening that's now not going to happen. It's a lot of food for the soil that's now not going to go in there to feed the soil. And, like, we have insects on here that are protecting the plants. I'll talk about that next, but... If we systematically remove all this stuff every time it grows, this stuff has atoms inside of it. It has elements inside of it, minerals, nutrients. So if we're constantly pulling that out and putting it in a bag down at the end of our street, then we're constantly removing material from our soil and sending it off site. I don't have a problem if someone wants to come in and pull weeds that they don't like systematically weed a lot. I'm not saying don't weed. I'm saying don't remove that nutrient. So if you want to weed, if there's plants you don't like, have a reason for it, understand what you're doing, pull those weeds out, compost them, put the compost back down. Pull those weeds out, chop them, drop them. And then replace those weeds with something else that you do want. Because if you give nature a space, nature will fill that space in. So if you want something else there, plant something else there and then maximize those solar panels. Because one reason is that a lot of people don't even know what a weed is. There's no such thing as a weed. Like weeds don't exist. Weeds are just plants that you don't want to exist there. 
this is lamb's quarters. I talk about it all the time, but this is something that people consider a weed. It's actually a delicious green and it's food for other insects as well. So if I pull this lamb's quarter out, I should at least know why I'm doing it. If I'm doing it because I want to have more sunlight for the peaches down here, that's fine if that's what you want to do. And then I should make sure that I focus on returning the materials in this lamb's quarters back to the system somehow. So compost it and put the compost back. Or just chop it and lay it down and let nature do what nature does. But I shouldn't be weeding plants because I don't know what they are and I don't know what they do. I just know that I didn't plant them. Because there's many useful plants that are native to your local habitat that the native insect population loves to eat, that they depend on eating, that we remove because we don't know what it is, we don't, we never planted it, we don't want it there, we don't know why we didn't, don't want it there, we just know that we don't want it there, right? Just have a better reason than that. Another really good thing about that is that a lot of plants that people think are weeds are actually beautiful flowers. And we never know because we pick it too soon. We never let them go to flower. We never get to see the bees on them, the butterflies on them, you know, the green lace wings, all this wonderful insect life that we're taught to be afraid of because we have this insectophobia. Um, we can do our best to try to get around that. Like look at the life that's circling and around this kind of wilder patch that I let, you know, air quote weeds grow in and all these predators are eating each other and keeping uh, bugs off of my pears, for example. So, you know, my pears this year have almost no coddling moths. They're looking really good. And coddling moths are always a problem here. So I have very little pest problems. I have a couple coddling moths, and we can talk about that as well, but for the most part, I get almost all my pears now. Now, I didn't want to get too into this, but I did want to mention it now that I kind of broke the seal on that last thing that I just said. Having this integrated pest management system where you leave some plants up for the insects, it doesn't mean you're not going to get pests. It just means that you can have a balanced number of pests because you can't have predators without pests. So it's not a whole thing, you know, I looked on my blank plant today and I saw a blank pest. What do I do about it? That's the mentality we have to get away from. Okay, and the last thing is that a lot of this stuff moves at nature's pace and nature's pace is slow. So don't give up on it after one year of trying this stuff out. This is something that takes a long time to build. Whether it's insect populations that might take a couple seasons for insects to naturalize, for insects to find that there's actually uh, food for them here in your area compared to everywhere else where there's no food. So it can, and soil to build, you know, for mulch and wood chips, carbon to break down, that takes time. So give it the time that it needs before you make your observation and conclusion. Sometimes, and I'll talk about this on my next video, sometimes we mess up systems because we have too short of a time frame that we're judging them in. Another thing that I say to do is mulch your soil. Mulch your soil, cover it, never bare soil, never bare soil. Again, it's not 100%. There are bees that do set hives in bare soil. So having a little bit of bare soil here and there on a flat area where the topsoil is not gonna erode away can actually be a good thing if you're trying to promote habitat for native bees that lay their nest and eggs inside bare soil. And again, do it if it makes sense, but have a reason why you're doing it. Do it from a place of information and knowledge. Understand the pitfalls of doing it, erosion. Understand the pitfalls of doing it, depressed soil life from the sun, UV, and the wind, baking that uncovered soil and less water retention. But if that's okay and you're okay with that because you set it up on a flat spot, you're doing it for a reason to promote native bee habitat, then that's okay and you do it in a little area and the rest of your garden's mulched. So it's not a sin to do it, have a reason for it. Have a reason for everything you do and come at it from a place of understanding and information. And another good reason for maybe having some bare soils is that citrus apparently like having bare soils because they're kind of like a desert plant. So if something's a desert plant and it's used to growing in desert conditions then you should 
create desert conditions for it to grow in if that's what you want to grow in that area again do it from a place of understanding know what the plant wants and uh, needs where it evolved in the ecosystem and then provide that for the plant so if citrus like having bare soil give bare soil to the citrus that's fine mulch the other stuff one thing I always tell people is don't use fertilizers. Let nature and organic material be the long-term, slow-release nutrients that your plant needs. Why is this sometimes, you know, it's systematically a good idea, but why is it sometimes maybe a one-time use time thing where it might be okay to use a little bit of fertilizer? If you're just starting up and you're making a garden, and you don't have access to uh, manure or you're starting your garden late in the season stuff like compost and manure will take time to break down um, manure or compost less so because it should be already broken down depends on how broken down it is but if you wanted to plant say a tree and fertilize it it's a bad idea but for annuals it might not be if I want this apple tree to develop it's a baby apple tree. If I wanted to develop deep root systems, I'm better off mulching heavily, giving it a lot of room to grow, giving it some companion plants, and letting it feed itself. Letting it struggle maybe a little bit, give it the water it needs at the beginning, but letting it struggle so that it has to say, oh crap, I need more roots, and it sends those roots out. If I fertilize this tree when I first plant it, if I put a lot of fertilizer in the hole, nice compost, you know, good mushroom compost right in a big hole for it. And then I water it and I baby it and I baby it. Then this tree never learns how to feed itself because it never needs to actually put down big roots. So comparing a tree that's kind of had to feed itself, it's kind of like your kids. If you do everything for your kids and they're 20 years old, they don't know how to fold laundry. But whose fault is that? It's probably your fault. If you do the same with your trees and they never learn how to feed themselves, it's kind of your fault as well. But for annuals, it's a different story. Because I'm not really concerned if my tomatoes are going to have strong, extensive root uh, systems next year. So if it's late in the season and you're starting, you know, a fall garden now and you're going from grass to garden and you may not have very good nutrients in it, don't feel bad about buying some balanced miracle grow fertilizer and apply it very sparingly but just for annuals this year, that's not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, you could probably argue that having a quicker growing plant right off the start in that bed is going to build soil through photosynthesis, plant root exudates, that'll help benefit your system long term for next year. So fertilizer is bad as a systematic crutch that you depend on to grow healthy plants for so many reasons not just the soil life but the whole transportation and mining and all that stuff comes into play but using a little box when you're just getting started mixing it into some compost so that you get a nice good uh, crop this fall to kind of get you happy and healthy and excited about gardening so that next year you can go full no-till full beyond organic and all that I don't have a problem with that so it's funny, you know, a hardcore permie is telling you maybe sometimes as a startup, it might be okay to use a fertilizer, right? So I hope that doesn't offend too many of you like hardcore types. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It's great to be hardcore about something like permaculture, but we have to be pragmatic at the same time. So if we're going to plant something now and it's just going to struggle for the next week or next month or two, because there's not a lot of time left in the season, there's no time to build soil, Someone's just getting started and then we're going to come down and judge them because they used a little miracle grow, right? Like get real. So we have to balance our insane passion for healing the planet and couch that by not attacking people when they use something that we maybe don't like. So like all things, I think the way to get people transitioned into beyond organic permaculture, no-till, back to Eden garden method, um, maximize solar panels, wild crazy, don't weed, plant things for animals, kind of food forest gardening on steroids is to accept them, to not judge them, and to try to inspire them, show them that this actually works better this way 
But again, it's the systematic long-term vision that gets us there. So a short-term startup that might help boost us to get faster to that long-term vision as a one-time thing might actually be okay. If we can get a small little box of balanced fertilizer in the ground and that gets a big cover crop area of daikons and clover and parsley and carrots and potatoes or whatever growing solar panels, it's probably better for the system to get that solar energy coming into the soil, build that soil life, get that soil life protected. Um, it's late in the season, get it going, get it going well, and then next year you can move into this systematic no-till, chop and drop, let some weeds grow, don't kill all your pests, right? Get balanced, integrated, and into this kind of, you know, crazy wild style that I like to teach. So don't think the things that I teach are never, never, never do. They're typically always do not systematically do this. But to start up, it might be sometimes in your best interest to do one or two of those naughty bad things. So if something doesn't work in the first year that you do it, just remember, nature works slower than us. Give it time. Try it out. If you want, run experiments so that you do it a little bit here, a little bit there, and then you compare. But make sure you run that experiment for long enough that you can actually get to the appropriate long-term health of your system conclusion. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.